Okay. So, hello, dear. Um, here we are again. It's very nice uh, to see you after this time and uh, having some time of chatting. Um, I have to say that uh, I've been particularly happy about our conversation um, and uh, for various reasons, not all of them make sense to be mentioned here, but um, as I uh, as I would like to highlight also in launching the book as the first edition with archive uh, books and hopefully further conversations also materializing in the form of a book, um, I'm particularly interested in the form of conversation uh, nearly as an art form. I think that, that conversations are really difficult. They're awkward. I'm probably the best example of an awkward person to have a conversation with, um, not only in this situation, but at the same time, I think that in conversations is so much that happens um, that is difficult to acknowledge, but is often very decisive for what we are, what we're doing, how we're navigating, um, especially in a in a um, in a sort of physical sociality um, that is is kind of funny now to say that over Zoom, but I think uh, it's something where you in a conversation you always relate, you relate with your body, you relate with awkward ways of pronouncing, uh, you relate with the gaps in between of what you say, and um, some part uh, of the book is definitely inspired or insisting on this. And I remember when we started the conversation that I also sometimes felt like awkward because I don't know that much about South Africa. And um, I, I just found the, the book or the thesis uh, that ended up somehow on my table um, very fascinating for for also you know complicated or maybe oppositional reasons um and i was very happy to start a conversation with you because that was also at the time when you guys had settled back to uh germany and it was actually possible to on some occasions meet randomly physical mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but uh Maybe one thing to to start um, is that this is sort of like looking back and in uh, in ways onto a social movement where you have been part and where you've now had you know lots of different experiences, but also the time of maybe looking back at it theoretical and and practical and also changing context. Um, so I would be curious if you you know would say a little bit in general, how you look back and, and what you think is now become relevant, maybe also for your future writing of Blackwash. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you say how the paper ended up randomly on your desk, because I think a week before you asked me if I would be willing to have this conversation with you I had been saying that ah now I was in this, this social movements because I've been in other social movements in South Africa after backwash and a little bit before that I felt that it felt like I had been in this action mode and I had nowhere to then put reflections on or to think back and be like, okay, because everything when it's happening, it's so fast. I mean, even when I was reading uh, the paper you're talking about that Nabakazi wrote, um, it's for me, it was like, ah, oh, yeah, I remember this happening, but I never had the time to really look back on what did it mean for us when we decided we are going to get on a taxi after hearing there's been a massacre. Uh, a few hours away from us and we're going to just go and see how things are and how we can support and and things like that but we never had the chance and the moment to actually afterwards be like oh we went there and um so just for context what, what happened there is that we were still in blackwash 
and uh, a couple of miners in, in Marikana, which is a town in South Africa, had been protesting for, I think, a couple of months even. I mean, the, the protests had been going on for weeks and dragging, and there was a stalemate here, and then things would be moving. But ultimately, it ended with uh, police shooting at people and, and, and killing several of the people. Uh, so when we first heard the story, it was the story of violent minors who went out of hand and got shot by the police. Um, but because of the work that we were doing in the movement anyway, we already took those kind of narratives with a pinch of salt. So already one of the reasons we had to go and see for ourselves is because we couldn't um, understand how a couple of protesting um, people with a legitimate uh, cause for why they protesting would suddenly all of a sudden be this violent uh, monsters. Ultimately, what we found out is that it, the, the, the violence was unprovoked by the police, but everything that we were hearing in the media at the time was saying the opposite. And we were one of the first people to actually report in the opposite by doing some sort of citizenship journalism or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and somehow when we did kind of feed that into mainstream, some of the reporting and some of the narratives that were being formed were uh, somehow more flexible now. Until now, I mean, if you look at it now with Marikana, everybody who's reporting on it, both in South Africa and internationally, know that those miners were now the victims in the situation and that the police were the ones who were doing uh, undue violence and, and, and things like that. But part of how that went down, we had nowhere else to put because I can't reflect on it. The next thing is coming on and we have to move on to the next thing and the next thing. Um, so I, 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 I like that we, had this, I had this moment to have a conversation with you, no matter how awkward <laughs> it may have been. I'm also an awkward person generally to talk with, but parts of the most important uh, moments, even when I've been in Blackwash, were actually the conversations we would be having while we are doing the work. This is where I got most of my political education, not by us, um, reading bell hooks or by us reading Steve Vigo or by us sharing a film about Thomas Sangara or whatever else, which was all well and good, but where I really got to be able to understand where people's consciousness is coming from as well is by having conversations for, with people, finding out where they're coming from. I mean, even in the discussion where I mentioned about how some of the members of Black Wash came from religious family backgrounds. These were things that we did not talk about in a formal meetings. These were things that I got to understand about the person from having, yeah, regular conversations. So I yeah. agree with you, basically. <laughs> Yeah, I also, I mean, in the text uh, or in the actual interview, you you also mentioned that some of these places, places were informal places so that they were not universities and that they were not, you know, conferences or panels or um, official places where people met, but bars and, you know, sort of uh, uh, meeting places of a more informal social um surrounding so I thought that you know maybe that is also something where we exchange in a different way or maybe things can influence in 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 other ways um but uh yeah so I mean depending on what you call informal you know because like uh, you know uh, as artists uh, and that that's one of the things that I I also found very interesting as an artist, because you mentioned that um, most of you were some sort of trained in uh, media and journalism. So in a way you had learned also different ways of expressing um, verbally with language, but also with other, I would say artistic means like the t-shirts, but um, 
And uh, do, you, do you think that that is also a necessary skill for like uh, something to, to organize or to, to actually connect to people with a more larger reverberation or echo possibility? Um, I think yes and no, yes, because in, in, in our case, it certainly helped. It, it certainly um, did have this, it did give us this confidence, this advantage where we knew how to sell a message with minimum words. And I think that this certainly helped us a, a, along the way. At the same time, I, I say no, because it was a skill that gave us privilege. It did not mean that we were the only people who saw the status quo for what it is. It didn't mean that we were smarter than everybody our age or whatever. It, mean, it, it only meant that we had access to language, access to a way of expressing ourselves, which is not only um, which is not only understandable to who we thought of as the people we were talking to, which would be uh, people within the black community in South Africa. Uh, we were accessible in that way because they are used to messages from television. They are used to receiving messages via radio and 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 um, and t-shirts and, and and all the platforms we didn't create anything new we just tweaked what was already a vehicle that they understand for getting messages but just put in our own messaging um because the reason i saw the privilege in that eventually is that we had attract attracted enough young black people uh, in Soweto, in other parts of Johannesburg, who did not necessarily go to college, who did not necessarily go finish high school. Uh, some of them were still in high school. Some of them were high school dropouts. So it was a variety of people who in one way or the other had gotten part of our messaging. And how then Blackwash grew its messaging was through how they were doing things, to be honest. Um, and it didn't uh, rely on my journalism knowledge of this and that, but it came with the poetry that they were doing already. It came with the songs that they were writing already, which were not necessarily the songs that we are hearing in our mainstream media at the time. Um, these were really, at the time, I think, some of the people who were in Blackwash at the time were really really talented artists in other forms that were not necessarily accessible in the mainstream. And so in those sp spaces, we formalized ourselves. And so as, as you were saying earlier about what's formal and what's informal, for us, being in a community theater and having that meeting and having that cultural exchange and everything else was the institution everything else that was happening in Santon or in um, the areas where people have access to a lot of other things didn't matter. For us, the center was in that moment, in that school, in Soweto, doing whatever we were doing. But that's maybe the beginning of, uh, you know, if you take it as a constructive thing, an institution that it's, uh, you know, the basis of, of uh, social organization um maybe it actually has to come from nothing and then you know being something that that creates it itself uh, from what the people created uh, and not to take on a structure i think because we you know historically or i am also in this uh, uh, in this uh, series of conversations i'm also interested in historical uh, uh, formations of, of collectives. I've myself been most of the, my artistic uh, life been part of collectives. Um, and I've also initiated uh, uh, some of them for some time or, you know, maybe suspended, maybe, you know, coming together again, maybe finishing. Um, 
But uh, that uh, brings me to this, this other point that I had highlighted when I read um, our conversation again, is that, um, that you call it, we were suspicious of individualism um, and, and needed, uh, you know, the, the, or we, we felt the necessity to organize um, as a collective. Because in the art, you know, we have so much individualism. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's actually, again, a special time of the artist ego to its <laughs> worst. And at the same time, you know, maybe it's also influenced by a lot of hopelessness or, or kind of uh, feeling difficulties of organizing collectively um, from, from whatever psychological society, special contexts. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's nearly, nearly undebatable that uh, to change conditions of sociality, let's say um, in, or in, a, in a smaller or in a bigger circle can only come through collective organizing. Um, but uh, I was particularly interested in this suspicious of individualism. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, in the conversation earlier, I say the kind of schools that uh, we all kind of went to. And um, a thing I think we all had in common about what happened in those schools was that you kind of were bullied into thinking for about yourself only. So uh, you hardly had any sort of team collective uh, learning, but it was rather about school is a competition. Uh, you gotta ace it or you trash basically. And so, for you to make it in school, you had to be the best to try and get the awards, to try and get a trophy at the prize giving or the certificates and, and all of that. So I think the, one of the reasons we were suspicious initially also is because when we would talk about our schooling, we would come to the conclusion that we were being taught to do this one thing, which is to simply think about the one rather than the all at all times, or at least make that the most important part of being human or whatever it is. Um, and part of why probably that was a big thing for us is that when we would go home uh, to our black families, at the end of the day, there's a whole communal belief system there um, that we, we've grown up into, which is why there's two worlds somehow clash a little bit uh, more clear than maybe somebody who's not uh, used to that kind of thinking before. Um, and I'm not saying that Black people or African people are more communal than everybody or um, think more collectively, but there was the spaces where even if it's about the oppression that we're all experiencing at the time results in poverty and when you're living around poor people and you are all poor the best thing to do for survival is to share so you can't think that just because you have all the potatoes today that you can't share because you know two three weeks down the line you're the one who's going to be needing the potatoes uh, so that creates this kind of uh, in, inter code dependence uh, on each other. Even the way that we would share school lunches, for instance, I found that in the schools that I would go to, and I mean, I did say that we were some of the first Black kids to go to filter into what used to be white schools. We would see in the way that we have lunch, in the way that... Uh, our fellow white students are having lunches. Things are very separate with them, whereas things are very, oh, let's get together. Who's got what? Let's just share. Um, so part of it, our suspicion, I guess, is because, and then the third thing, of course, it, it's not our Bible or anything, but 
reading Steve because I write what I like was one of the things that we'd all done in Blackwash. Uh, we discussed the book pre-founding Blackwash. We would discuss the book during political education classes and all of that. And one of uh, if one of the chapters that are very uh, good to read is one where Steve Biko is talking about uh, individualism versus communalism. And, 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 and really, I think it was convincing for us that not only is trying to get back to a communal collective group sort of, uh, not group thinking as such, but having the needs of the group being uh, more important, or at least know that individuals form the group, but you can't have the individuals as being the end result of, uh, I don't know, what else? Uh, I don't know how to explain it properly. This is where the awkward part of the conversation <laughs> come in. <laughs> um, so for us, anything that's about individualism was uh, suspicious. Maybe we're even hyper suspicious where it, it got to a point where because we want to all agree uh, before moving forward in certain decisions, some things take slower than they should. Or because we all have to, I don't know, have a say in it, we're going to end up not doing something because we just can't find the middle ground of it all. Uh, or the fact that there were certain things that people could get away with not doing because we don't have a clear hierarchy of where it ends, where's the back ending, who's going to be held accountable eventually for something not going right or something going right. Um, but we try to work within that structure as chaotic as it was. I still think that uh, it, it had a lot of benefits for us in how we were working. Um, yeah. So I think that's the background of how suspicious we've always been when we started the movement about anything that smells of individualism is already something that's to be looked at quite closely. Yeah, wow. Thank you for, you know, um, especially the the thing with the school, because we, we easily forget that these things are actually, we're trained to these things, uh, not only from the family, but let's say from official institutions. Uh, this is something that infiltrates us and, and to, we actually have to work against it, I would say, if you want to, um, not only with suspicion, but also with, um, with actual action. Um, uh, and I think, I mean, sorry, part of, uh, why social movements can, uh, disintegrate sometimes is also because of this individualism that has that has also crept in. And you talk about the artist's ego. I mean, the ego there is. <laughs> you you hear us telling everyone you are, you you are going to change the world. So of course, ego levels are already at a high there. So yeah. Massive, yeah, exactly. Um, no, thank you so much. I mean, this is uh, this is actually really to the point of I think also what has to to kind of like bother us now with the you know the geopolitical situation that uh, there's there's so much about borders and about weapons and nations and how are we the nation and how are you the nation and um, I mean I know that's like a huge zoom out but still you wonder like why is let's say oh, news conversations are so much more defined by that than thinking about like what what actually do we have in common or what, what goals do we have? Let's say peace. Uh, I'm, I'm really surprised how few times the word peace happens in the you know, 45 days of Ukrainian war. It's hardly the word weapon shows up like a lot, you know, like in every second sentence. But peace, uh, there were like, you know, 10 days ago, I, mean, I said, like, I, I think we need to go hunger strike and like talk about peace and look at like, where, why is there no peace? Anyway, I'm getting off <laughs> talking about it. But um, 
maybe one uh, last uh, 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 question to this, because I also want you to, to tell a little bit what your plans are now and how you how you look back in the time or of the whole thing of Blackwash with the sort of engagements you have now as a, you know, as a writer, as being separate from that community, but maybe engaged in a different kind of community where you are now and still, um, uh, you know, being influenced and, and, and kind of uh, having this tissue with you or uh, all the thoughts and, and maybe also conversations. Yeah. No, I hear you. I mean, Blackwash still, I mean, still continues né? to this day. There are people who are engaged in, 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 in Blackwash movement. I mean, it's slightly changed in certain ways, but I know that it's very strong in Soweto. Um, I don't think it's national. I think it's still just based in Soweto at the moment because I'm not as uh, clued up as I used to be about things. Um, but for me, I don't know. I mean, Black Horse was very, very instrumental in, 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 in shaping who I am, in shaping how I see the world, um, what I think I can bring to the table, or that I at least know that I'm not, um, I'm not just a passive thing that's put on this earth to live off my days and die I guess or, or whatever else um, so for that it will always be a very special thing to look back on and think on but it's more that now I use that kind of attitude of I have this way of looking at the world which may not necessarily be everybody's way because we really I don't know, we honed in on how to not necessarily use theory to explain your environment, but to use your lived experience to inform theory. Um, and I think that's something that in a lot of stuff we were doing at the time was always the thing at the back of our head on, on, on how we're doing it. So, what I do now in my writing, I mean, I'm writing a novel now, and it's a, uh, it's about a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's about a girl who's in a forced marriage and whatever else that it is. But what I try to do in that book, I think, is have this central question of how does the lived experience of a black person who is. Um, very much proud of their identity, of their culture and all these things, but somehow can be hurt within that process where you are living in a culture where you can technically have your brother, your older, uh, your father, your uncle marry you off in, 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 in certain circumstances. And so it's about trying to grapple with this question, but not as a oh, arranged marriages are wrong because uh, it's just wrong, but from a perspective that only I think a person who has a particular lived experience can explore this topic on. Um, so I don't know about the other future plans I may have. I don't know um, if I'm interested in joining any sort of social movement here. But I do know that I will forever probably have some sort of collective thing I have to be part of. So I love collectives. I will probably do it for all. I think numbers are way better than one at all times. Uh, you share skills you would never in your whole life dream of having because you just happen to be in a collective with somebody who's got all that. Uh, so I think there's a still a lot of stuff to be explored around working in collectives. Um, yeah, so something like that I probably will be doing, but yeah. Wow, yeah, thank you. I mean, um, there's this particular 
this other term that I it just came to my mind also when you were talking about the non hierarchical um because I'm actually very happy that we didn't talk so much about toxic, toxic masculinity, <laughs> which would be, <laughs> that would be another time. And I know that it's, it's actually a burning time. Uh, uh, I think we do live in a misogynist, uh, a deep, deep misogynist, especially in the West uh, and, and, in, uh, and um, the big traces in, in Norway and in Germany as well. But I like this saying because we are now in this awkward Zoom thing and um, uh, you say like we have each other's backs, you know, when you guys were struggling or maybe there were some pitfalls and, then, you know, I think like collectives actually can make maps of like really difficult situations where not only because of individualism, but because of like, oh, maybe we should dissolve, we can't climb that obstacle, this is too much of an external power smashing us and so on but this as a physical image i you know but you should have the last word but i really like this having each other's backs because <laughs> that is something where you know i have i'm a cyborg i have an artificial back but like it's really necessary to have a you know to have someone's back no for sure i don't have no I think your last words, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty on point. <laughs> <laughs> Let's agree on having the last words together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Collectively. <laughs> Collectively. So to say over Zoom, over distant, you know, from there to there. Um, and hopefully in the future, much, much more. Yes. As always, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope we can have you for a little snippet live as well. But uh, thank you. And I'm stopping the recording officially here. Okay. <laughs> sure thing. Thank you for having me. I am excited about the book. That's for thank sure. you. Oh, now.